Ian Miller with uh, the Washington Sea Grant Program. I'm a coastal hazard specialist uh, based in uh, Port Angeles, Washington, the Strait of Juan de Fuca. And what we wanted to try to provide today was kind of an overview of how Sea Grant is attempting to uh, work with coastal communities in Washington around preparing for impacts associated with sea level rise. And I'm uh, co-presenting today with Sydney Fishman. So Sydney, uh, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? Hi, everyone. I'm Sydney Fishman. I'm the Coastal Management Specialist with Washington Sea Grant, and I'm based out of Olympia, Washington. And um, a few things that we wanted to note. One, uh, a reminder for the presentation today is that we, um, we do anticipate hopefully having time for questions and answer at the end, kind of in a traditional way, either via chat or uh, coming off of mute if you prefer. But during the presentation, if you have any pressing questions that are sort of, I guess, more of response or a, or a clarifying question about something you see in a slide, for example, put that into the chat. And then as we go along, Sydney and I are going to be trading off speaking and we'll use those transitions to address anything that we feel like um, needs to be addressed before we move on. Um, the other thing is because we sort of built this as like an overview of, of kind of what we're a variety of things that we're doing within Sea Grant. We also are going to have a lot of links that we're going to be throwing into the chat. So just be prepared for that if you wanted to try to collect those. Um, you know, otherwise, just note that your chat's going to be full of those links going by. Um, so with that, I'm going to move on to our outline. So basically, what we prepared today was a quick overview of what Sea Grant is for those of you that may be unfamiliar with it. And by the way, nice to see so many familiar names going by um, on my Zoom screen here, um, but also some unfamiliar names. And so Sea Grant may also be unfamiliar. Um, and then we're going to briefly touch on basically observed and projected sea level relevant to Washington um, and what that means for potentially for impacts in Washington. Again, very briefly. And then we're going to follow that with going over kind of the things that our Sea Grant team is focusing on as priorities. And then we're going to use that as a jumping off point for highlighting how we're trying to address those priorities through some example programs or projects that we're going to frame as a sort of a series of vignettes. And then we'll hopefully have time for questions and answer at the end. So, um, Brief introduction to Sea Grant, again, for those of you that are unfamiliar with it. So we are part uh, of a network of 32 programs uh, around the United States and its territories. Those programs are uh, partially funded by Congress and then also partially by each state in which they reside. They are always university associated. So in our case, we are housed within the University of Washington. Um, each program operates more or less independently within the state in which it is, um, but is guided by national strategies that are kind of administered out of uh, NOAA's headquarters uh, in Maryland. So our National Sea Grant office, for example, sits within NOAA's headquarters. So we do have that kind of relationship to NOAA. The roots of our program, though, are in the extension model that started with, uh, at least in the United States, with land-grant colleges probably before that. Um, which are designed to sort of bridge this, uh, um, you know, this kind of uh, realm between uh, communities that can use information to manage any number of problems and quote unquote academic knowledge, what I've characterized here on this slide as the ivory tower, um, to, to address real world problems. And when it comes to coastal resilience in particular, um, Sea Grant programs across the country and ours in particular leverage a variety of strengths and strategies to support coastal communities. Um, and they're becoming increasingly recognized for the role that we play in this kind of quote unquote coastal resilience realm, this realm of trying to sort of help communities prepare for contemporary and future hazards in ways that allow them to thrive uh, through those hazards. So there's a kind of a list of five here that are derived from a paper that we recently published in a special issue of oceanography focused on Sea Grant programs. But really, you'll see some of these things reflected as we go along, especially in the project vignettes. So especially, I'd, I'd sort of draw your attention to this idea that we have people distributed around the state. And so that gives us this kind of insight about 
uh, sort of this constant, what I refer to as this constant gap assessment that's happening within our program. Continuous engagement, we're not built around uh, sort of limiting our engagement to if we have a funded project or something like that. Obviously that role of spanning boundaries uh, from a discipline standpoint is something that's really key to how Sea Grant operates. And then having a bunch of different capacities within our program, communication expertise, for example, social scientists all housed within the same program. And then finally an emphasis on applied research, which some of you may be familiar with um, either through some of the research programs that we run as staff or perhaps through our, um, through our um, internal funding program. So um, after that brief introduction to Sea Grant, uh, one space in which um, many programs around the country, including ours, is working is focused on sea level rise and trying to figure out how to prepare communities for the impacts associated with sea level rise. Um, our motivation for this work in Washington is simple. Sea level is rising in Washington at rates and patterns that are consistent with those that are so well reported globally. So what you're seeing on the screen here is a... Um, a data visualization derived from Washington's tide gauges. In and in this case, the vertical land movement from those tide gauges is removed. So it gives us a perspective, an observed perspective on what the ocean is actually doing, the level of the ocean is actually doing in Washington. And we do see an upward trend here, uh, something on the order of a rate of around five inches per hundred years or so over this kind of period of time that's shown in this record dating back to around the mid 20th century or so. And of course, many of you are probably familiar with sea level rise projections, like the ones that are shown here. These are from a assessment that Sea Grant led in 2018, um, published as part of the Washington Coastal Resilience Project. And on this particular view, we have uh, time out to 2100 on uh, the x-axis and then change in sea level in feet relative to basically a contemporary average. We have that same observed pattern I showed you previously, but then these kind of solid lines that represent a variety of future possibilities associated with different um, likelihoods or probabilities. And the key thing to note here is sort of upward curves for a lot of these, that classic hockey stick acceleration. Um, so again, takeaway is that we expect sea level to uh, accelerate as we move into the future. Probably doesn't come as a surprise to many of you. And in Washington, as is the case in other parts of the world, certainly, we actually may already be experiencing impacts of sea level rise, despite the fact that you know, we've only experienced inches over the last couple of decades. Uh, the December 27th, 2022 storm, on the photograph on your screen is from Gig Harbor during that particular event, impacted much of Puget Sound. And that actually may have been made possible, the, the, at least the records that were broken during this particular event, the magnitudes at which, or the, the height to which the ocean reached around Puget Sound may have been sort of made possible by even that few inches of sea level rise that we've experienced. So it gives us a taste for the possible impacts as those rates accelerate. So I'm now going to pass it off to Sydney, who's going to dive into introducing our team and our priorities. Thanks, Ian. And I just want to note, if anyone is having any tech issues, please message Marielle. Um, she's running the Zoom, so she can help you out with any technical difficulties. But uh, turning our attention to the Coastal Resilience team and Washington Sea Grant had been recognizing this growing need associated not only with sea level rise, but also a suite of other stressors and hazards facing, uh, facing Washington's coastal communities. Sea Grant has been working since 2011 to build a team of coastal resilience experts who are positioned around the state and provide a diverse range of services and backgrounds and experiences to serve Washington's coastal tribes and stakeholders. And uh, that team, our team is currently focused around four different priority areas. And conveniently, these will also be the priority areas that we're using to organize the remainder of our talk. And so those priorities are hazard exposure assessment, 
assessing vulnerability, support for community adaptation and resilience, and finally connecting, advancing, and training. And as Ian mentioned earlier, we're gonna go through each of these in turn and highlight an example project that illustrates how these priority areas connect to our sea level rise work. So our first priority area is focused on what is often kind of the first step in anyone's effort to understand or to plan for a hazard, which is assessing and understanding the exposure to that hazard. Our Sea Grant Resilience team is involved in a variety of efforts to um, kind of advance our understanding of exposure to hazards. So not just sea level rise, but also for example, we have a member of our team who focuses on tsunami hazards. And you heard Ian talk a little bit about those sea level rise projections, but the example that we want to illustrate today is a project that Sea Grant has been supporting since 2018, which is the implementation of the US Geological Survey or U USGS's Coastal Storm Modeling System, or COSMOS, here in Washington State. And so I'll be explaining what role Washington Sea Grant has been playing in the rollout of COSMOS in Washington, and also share why we're so excited for our Washington coastal communities to have access to this tool. So as Ian suggested earlier, Washington is facing sea level rise with projections showing sea levels will likely be one and a half to two and a half feet higher by 2100. But we know the fact that sea level rise is coming is not enough. Uh, that knowledge is not enough to answer some of the planning and other management questions that folks have. And communities and planners are curious about, for example, what about the impacts of storm surge and waves, wanting to know where exactly flooding is predicted to occur, and how will people and infrastructure be impacted by this flooding? And you may know that sea level rise projections themselves they're just numbers. They don't show the extent of flooding on a map and they and they certainly don't tell you outright who and how people are going to be impacted. And yet these are crucial for assessing the impacts and exposures to flood water. So to get at our interest in answering these questions and how we heard about these from communities, I think it's important to go back in time just a little bit to some of Washington Sea Grant's past projects that really laid the foundation and demonstrated the need for a tool like Cosmos here in Washington. Uh, Washington Sea Grant has been working with coastal communities for well over a decade. Uh, one example is we partnered with the Jamestown Slalom Tribe on uh, a groundbreaking climate planning report that they did that came out in 2013. And the lessons learned from that project and others informed uh, what we called the Washington Coastal Resilience Project, uh, which was back in kind of the 2018 timeframe that was funded by NOAA and was really focused on enhancing sea level rise planning in Washington through a variety of strategies, including updated sea level rise projections and easy access to Washington relevant planning information. So those, those two projects are highlighted here on the screen. And while it's important to note that the sea level rise projections that came out of that project were a huge step in the right direction, one of the things that this project was not able to provide, but that communities clearly wanted and needed, was access to information about water levels and impacts beyond just sea level rise, and also map-based results. And thankfully, these are two things that the Coastal Storm Modeling System, or COSMOS, is able to provide. So the Coastal Storm Modeling System, COSMOS, um, it captures what's called dynamic water level or total water level information. So not just uh, the contribution of flooding caused by sea level rise, but also um, wave run up, storm surge, and other impacts that can ultimately make the flooding on any given day or any given storm event more severe than what just the sea level rise projections would show. And it provides all of this information in a map that's freely accessible online. So just a little bit more information about Cosmos, but we're not going to get into the nitty gritty details, but uh, we can definitely point you to those resources. But COSMOS, again, it stands for the Coastal Storm Modeling System, and it's actually a combination of 
uh, inputs from different models, so global climate models, oceanographic models, wave models, and others, working together to determine where floodwaters are going to go at a coastal location. And so as I mentioned, it's accounting for what you can call these dynamic processes, like flooding associated with large waves, for example, which really distinguishes Cosmos and we think makes it um, incredibly useful and maybe better suited to the types of use cases we have here in Washington, where a lot of our storms and flooding are caused by low pressure systems where you have the water levels you know, rising up, especially with winter storms. And Cosmos captures those things and it, um, it distinguishes itself from other inundation models that you might be familiar with or maybe have visited online before, like for example, the NOAA sea level rise viewer. That's a great tool, but it's what's called a, a bathtub model. So it, it's only showing the static sea level rise inundation and it's not capturing um, the impacts from those other dynamic processes like waves, for example. And also, as I said, Cosmos is freely available um, through an interactive mapping viewer. Here's an example of what it looks like. Um, and it makes it easily accessible you know, for anybody, any planner, any community who wants to check it out and get more information to use for planning. And as I mentioned, we envision that there are many different potential use cases here in Washington for Cosmos. Uh, kind of on the planning side of things, some use cases might include neighborhood scale decision making, um, using these data to update comprehensive or shoreline plans being done by local governments. Um, another is potentially planning for infrastructure, so the siting of roadways or understanding threats to critical infrastructure like wastewater treatment plants. But also we envision some site specific or project specific uses, such as um, trying to understand and engineer for future water levels or even planning for restoration, whether that's thinking across Puget Sound about you know, what are some of the most at-risk restoration sites or the best sites for restoration, the most resilient sites, or even figuring out how high the water levels might get and are the plants that you're going to plant at a certain elevation going to be inundated too frequently. Those are some of the things that Cosmos might be able to help with. And excitingly, we already have an example of a use case here in Washington. So Whatcom County was our first jurisdiction in Washington to receive the Cosmos flood products. And they were able to complete uh, a compound flood vulnerability assessment for their shorelines, looking at the impacts of marine and freshwater flooding to understand um, the extent of flooding and also evaluate the impacts of the flooding to some of their local assets. And excitingly, so they had, they had received a grant to complete this work. And then following that, they were able to get another grant to uh, try to incorporate this information into their local shoreline plans. So if you'd like to learn more about Whatcom County's work, Ian's just posted a link to this report that's been screenshotted here. Also, Whatcom County has a really neat story map that they've put together about their process and the data and some of the decisions that they'll be making. And then additionally, on September 17th, so coming up pretty soon, there's going to be a Lunch and Learn hosted by the Coastal Hazards Resilience Network. And it's going to have two speakers from Whatcom County talking about this report and the work that they've done. So if you want to hear even more details and you want to hear it directly from the folks who were working on it, um, I encourage you to check out that Lunch and Learn as well. Uh, hopefully at this point we've gotten you curious about Cosmos. Maybe you're already starting to think about how this information might be useful to your work, and maybe you're curious about whether the data are available in your geography. So this is a graphic. Uh, it was updated just a couple weeks ago. I will note that these timelines can change, but as of August 20th, so quite recently, um, this displays the different products um, that are associated with the Coastal Storm Modeling System and when they are going to be made available. So you'll notice in the big kind of yellowish box, that's indicating that groundwater hazard products are actually available already for all of all of the Puget Sound counties. And for the Pacific Coast, those groundwater products are expected at the end of 2025, so coming out pretty soon. For the flood products, you'll notice that Whatcom County 
has their products available already. King and Pierce County are next. The modeling is underway and they're expected to get their products in mid 2025. And then in 2026 and 2027 are when we anticipate the rest of the Puget Sound counties and then respectively the Pacific Coast counties to receive um, the flood products. And lastly, uh, we're not gonna spend too much time on this, but uh, associated with Cosmos is also a shoreline change or an erosion hazard product, and that's going to be made available for the Pacific Coast counties um, expected in the end of 2026. So you'll be hearing a lot more about Cosmos in the coming months and years, and more and more jurisdictions are going to be getting these products as they're rolling out, and Washington Sea Grant will be right there to help folks use these products. And that really, I just wanna highlight and emphasize what Washington Sea Grant's role is in the outreach and engagement, right? Because USGS is producing the models. They're the ones who are putting the data online into the viewer and making the data available for downloading. But we really view our role in bridging the gap between folks who want to use the data, but maybe haven't heard about it or don't know how to use it, and the fact that the data are available. So I will just briefly share kind of what Sea Grant's three goals are in outreach and engagement. The first being just that folks are aware of Cosmos and kind of understand that it exists and view it as credible and actionable. And hopefully the fact that we are doing this presentation to 165 people, hopefully that's 165 more folks who have now heard about Cosmos and at least are curious about it. And then that brings us to the second goal, which is that Cosmos results are actually being used for coastal planning, restoration and management. And so we do not wanna limit people's um, ideas about how Cosmos can be used. We really think that it has broad applicability for our region. And so everything from local planners to restoration practitioners, transportation network planners, and anyone in between, um, we think Cosmos has applicability to their work if they're concerned about sea level rise and flooding. And finally, the third goal that we have is that the Cosmos results are freely available, accessible, and can be used for environmental justice initiatives and within vulnerable or historically underserved communities. So I mentioned earlier that, yes, Cosmos results are available online for free. You can go check them out right now. But we also know that it's not enough just to post data online. It's not enough to just have a map viewer. Um, folks need technical assistance, they need training, they need to hear examples and case studies of how other people have been using the data. So we really view our role at Washington Sea Grant is to make, uh, to make the data more accessible, more personal, more understandable, so that people feel comfortable using it. And then specifically to provide um, capacity technical assistance to communities that maybe, for example, can't afford to hire a consultant to study it on their behalf or to produce sea level rise projections on their behalf. Cosmos is a great tool for that, but Washington Sea Grant knows that people need assistance in, in using that work and being able to incorporate this information into the planning or the advocacy that they want to do for their communities. So we are here to um, advance that and help people get what they need. And lastly, I'll just highlight some connections between Cosmos and some other Washington Sea Grant work and also work that our partners are doing. So one example, Whatcom County, as I mentioned, is using this information for shoreline planning, but we know in the next couple of years uh, with various state agencies undertaking rulemaking around sea level rise and then those rules, um, those rule requirements trickling down to local governments, more and more jurisdictions are going to be planning for sea level rise, and we believe that Cosmos can help them with that. Additionally, uh, vulnerability assessments are becoming more common, not just in the planning sector or you know, in the local land use planning sector, but across all different um, sectors and entities that are located on the shoreline. So we believe that Cosmos is going to be incredibly helpful for that work, and Washington Sea Grant supports a variety of vulnerability assessments. And then lastly, uh, Washington Sea Grant is involved in various on the ground resilience projects that are led by communities and, and scoped by communities. And so we think that um, Cosmos can inform the assessment of vulnerability and also the potential design and um, brainstorming around different products or uh, sorry, different projects that can address those community vulnerabilities. So with that, I will pass it back to Ian.
Excellent. Thank you. So um, we're going to move on now to, to this second program priority that we outlined, um, which was alluded to in Sydney's previous slide there. But this is uh, supporting the assessment of vulnerability uh, within Washington's coastal community. Um, and this concept of vulnerability is um, is a what we we kind of view it as a critical step um, in trying to figure out how to adapt to impacts associated with sea level rise. Um, but it's also in some ways quite complex. It's got uh, you know it relies on that good exposure information. So what I'm showing you on the screen now is kind of this vulnerability represented somewhat quali uh, quantitatively. And I don't know if everyone can see my mouse, but I'm going to use it. So here's that exposure we that we kind of outlined. Yes. We can see the mouse. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so, you know, we, we see this exposure that we represented in, in as our first priority, right? Sort of doing a good job of figuring out where the hazards are, um, how frequently all that kind of information is represented here. And that's important. Um, but what's also represented in this assessment of a, a, a vulnerability is intersecting that exposure with what we frame as sensitivity. And this particular sort of represent, representation of vulnerability comes from um, sort of the, the climate change world. Some of you may have seen this represented in other worlds and the terms used and defined a little differently. But this kind of idea of sensitivity gets at the consequences of the interaction with a hazard. What happens, how much damage occurs, uh, for things that we care about or that we're particularly interested in. Uh, and that sort of statement also brings in values that may be established by a community or a jurisdiction or a tribe, for example. And then both of those things can be modified by this idea of adaptive capacity. These can be uh, human behaviors. They can be ecosystem characteristics. They can be um, um, demographic characteristics that all sort of combine in different ways to either uh, change exposure or change sensitivity. Um, this adaptive capacity is wide ranging uh, and can sort of uh, include a lot of different things. But Sea Grant has a long history of engaging with communities on the assessment of vulnerability to sea level rise. Historically, most of that is through what, what I'm sort of characterizing here as traditional approaches. These sort of typically will involve uh, organizing a group of people, typically sort of a local expert st stakeholder group of some kind, you know, representing in some way impacts associated with sea level rise, if it's a sea level rise vulnerability assessment, um, with that group, typically through maps that people are gathered around, a, or gathered around around a table or in a room, and then going through some process to basically try to uh, use that group's local expertise to derive information about what's impacted in the areas uh, outlined on the map. But another way to sort of go about, going, go about doing this is with more of a data-driven approach. So the vignette that we're going to focus on now is an example of a vulnerability assessment that we uh, just launched the second phase of um, that is a data-driven approach for trying to accomplish the same objective, figure out where in this case within Puget Sound, the most vulnerable places in our uh, places are. So, so we launched this partnership or this project um, in 2020 as a partnership with Coastal Geologic Services and it was funded by the Habitat Strategic Initiative, um, which is part of sort of the Puget Sound restoration world. Um, and this project uh, rests on the, uh, this is kind of like a relatively new approach that rests on the availability of data that you can use within, you know, this geographic in information system world. So rested on the 2018 projections that we've already talked about, which localized sea level rise projections for all of Washington state, as well as high resolution elevation data that the USGS published in 2020. And ultimately what we wanted to try to do was essentially score and relatively rank the vulnerability of over 110,000 uh, parcels, uh, you know, the land ownership parcels in Puget Sound. Um, so we conducted that project completed it as kind of a pilot project. Uh, 
and felt that it was successful enough to then propose and launch a second phase, which we just started a few months ago. And that second phase is going to expand that analysis to uh, the entrance of the Strait of Juan de Fuca. The previous, uh, previously, it didn't include most of the Strait of Juan de Fuca because of the limitations associated with available data. And then more importantly, make the results uh, much easier uh, and more accessible so that they can be used. Um, so notably, one of the sort of key outcomes of this project will be a uh, sort of an interactive website that allows users to really sort of uh, negotiate and play with and interact with these uh, vulnerability sorts of data sets. So I'm not, uh, I, I wasn't planning on digging into the details of, um, of that phase one project or the results or the methodology. If you want to dig into that, there's two places to go. One is that there is a website um, on the Coastal Hazards Resilience Network or a page on the Co Coastal Hazards Resilience Network website that describes the project. The results are available there. All of the technical documentation is available there. And then there's also an open access publication in the journal Sustainability that broadly describes the methodology and the results for Puget Sound. But kind of in brief, the approach, again, using that vulnerability framework that I showed you at the beginning, was to map hazards like erosion and flooding that are exacerbated by sea level rise onto parcels in Puget Sound um, as a way to identify those places that are most likely to experience these sea level rise exacerbated hazards first or most as sea level rises. Um, so in our case, we looked at erosion. So I'm showing you kind of these Puget Sound wide maps of results, which are, you know, unsatisfying, but gives you a sense for, for what, what the um, analysis focused on. But we mapped what we call the erosion potential and then coastal flooding, again, both sort of exacerbated by sea level rise, and then combine those into this exposure index. So where are the hazards? What parcels are most exposed? But again, this idea of vulnerability intersects that with what we call sensitivity. What is there that we value um, in those places that are exposed? So in this case, we coupled that information with data on things like buildings, um, roads, agricultural lands, and habitat migration to estimate, again, the sensitivity. What happens when we sort of expose that parcel to the hazards that we're looking at? And again, trying to understand what we value, how it's impacted. Um, and we combined those, these exposure and sensitivity to map what we started by calling a physical vulnerability score. Um, so I'm showing you again, a map of results for the Puget Sound of this kind of physical vulnerability, this exposure and sensitivity intersected. But doing this kind of revealed a couple of interesting things for Puget Sound that I wanted to highlight quickly. Um, so first of all, the pie chart that you see here is the distribution of all our scores. And the score was between 1 and 20, with 20 being the highest possible score. The most vulnerable parcels would have a score uh, upwards of 20. And this kind of like dark red little sliver here represents the highest sort of group of parcels that fell into scores between 14 and 20. And one of the things that we sort of took away from this was this, what we felt like was a hopeful sort of message that, you know, we have a relatively small number of parcels that fall into that highest vulnerability category, which suggests that we can put our effort into a relatively small number of places across Puget Sound to make big kind of gains in risk reduction and resilience uh, moving into the future. So again, something that this kind of analysis really allows us to look at uh, and maybe start to understand. And then the second is that vulnerability. So again, what you're seeing here is this Puget Sound wide perspective with the highest vulnerability parcels being in the hotter colors, lowest in the blue. And you really can't see it here because you see these blobs of red, but it's actually fairly widely distributed across Puget Sound. You do see these clusters in the river deltas, which is a fairly standard pattern around the globe. 
lots of sea level rise vulnerability in these low-lying river deltas. But we also see a fairly wide distribution, like if you could zoom into and interact with this map. So also something that we found of interest, again, given an emphasis on you know, low-lying delta lands frequently as being the most vulnerable. We actually see quite a bit distributed around the rest of the shoreline of Puget Sound. So um, in that vulnerability sort of conceptual model that I showed you, I also sort of highlighted the importance of adaptive capacity, this kind of idea that either we as individuals or uh, neighborhoods or communities can do certain things, maybe have capacities that help to reduce either exposure or sensitivity in some way, shape, or form. That's a really complex um, concept to quantify onto a parcel. And so that's something that we did not do in this uh, analysis. It also illustrates how complex this idea of vulnerability is. It's not something that is sort of like a uh, 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 a thing that we can measure necessarily like temperature, it's quite complex and starts to sort of pull in and require the um, help of social scientists, for example, to help us understand how people use and value and think about the landscape and what's on it, what we've built, what we may build. Um, so in the case of this project, we wanted to try to get at this to a degree by partnering with two social scientists from uh, NOAA's National Centers for Coastal and Ocean Science, NCOS, who developed and published a, uh, uh, a what they call the Social Vulnerability Index for Puget Sound. This was a, comp a complementary project that we were able to pull into our analysis uh, in a way to factor in some of those uh, sort of more human elements, some of those kind of community elements into our analysis. And we used this then uh, social vulnerability data to modify our vulnerability scores in ways that we felt like are insightful and helpful. Um, though also, also sort of clearly point out that to do this kind of regional assessment, um, you know, we need to sort of keep working on it, especially that human element, that social element. But in this particular case, I'm showing you um, that initial, uh, initial set of physical vulnerability results on the left here. Same one I showed you on the uh, a few slides previously. And then here is our uh, results modified with that social vulnerability work that was done by the team from NCOS. And I think most not notably what we kind of noted are, I'm trying to highlight it here with these black arrows, which are small, but really show uh, when we incorporate the social vulnerability element, we see more sort of of our overall sea level rise vulnerability relatively moving into some of the urban deltas that oftentimes we look at and say, there's vulnerability there, we know it. Um, so that was kind of, uh, we think, um, helpful to see as a way to just validate this approach and the results and hopefully turn this into something that's useful. Um, so I'm gonna turn it back over to Sydney for I think the remaining slides. That's true. But before I launch into my bit, um, someone just had a quick question. What is the base map for the land elevations for this project? Yeah, so this project was reliant on a, a USGS, uh, what they call a topobathymetric DEM for Puget Sound. Um, so obviously there's LIDAR data for lots of Puget Sound, but one of the things for that made this project go was having access to sort of free, public, regional uniform data sets. Um, we didn't have the capacity and don't have the capacity to like stitch together a bunch of LIDAR out there. Um, and so the USGS did that service for us. They published it in 2020 and that really made this project go. Awesome, thanks Ian. I know we got some other questions. I think we'll hold those other ones to the end and I'll just run through these last final few slides. Uh, so focus now uh, on the third priority of the Coastal Resilience Team, 
Increasingly, we are seeing jurisdictions, tribes, and even neighborhoods and homeowners who want to take some action. They're ready to take action on their lands and on their property to reduce their risk or increase their resilience. And so Washington Sea Grant's third focus area is figuring out the best way to support community adaptation and resilience. And the example that I'll be sharing is a new coastal resilience fellowship program that we're launching. If you are familiar with Washington Sea Grant, you may know that we have several existing fellowships uh, that support uh, current students and recent graduates in positions both at the national and at the state level. And we're really excited to be adding a fellowship specifically focused on coastal resilience and providing capacity to local governments and tribal governments. And so this new fellowship program is going to embed uh, folks in those local and tribal planning offices, providing capacity on things like grant writing, project management, partnership building, and others. And these are needs that have been expressed to us directly by our partners in the work that we've been doing over the past decade and a half. And so we're really excited to be able to bring more capacity to local entities while also supporting folks launching their coastal management careers. I got my start as a NOAA Coastal Management Fellow, and it's just really, really exciting to um, be able to support people getting started in their careers and to, to address this need um, with our coastal communities directly. And finally, I'll get into our fourth and final priority area, which focuses on the critical work of connecting, advancing, and training the folks doing this work. At the community level, one of the most common things that we are asked is, what, what is the jurisdiction next to us doing? What are, what are our neighbors doing? What are other people in our region doing? Uh, because we know that local governments and tribes and other folks working in this space are innovating constantly to adapt to new data and to adapt to new impacts. And this is certainly true in the realm of sea level rise planning adaptation. And so we think one of the most effective things that Washington Sea Grant can do is to try to make these connections and to help spread those innovations throughout our region. And so I'll be sharing the work of the Coastal Hazards Resilience Network or the CHURN. The Coastal Hazards Resilience Network or CHURN was founded in 2013 and it's co-led by Washington Sea Grant and the Washington State Department of Ecology. And its purpose and its goal is to share coastal resilience stories, approaches, successes, lessons learned, best practices, et cetera, throughout Washington. And so this website, um, Ian has probably posted the link in the chat already. And we've also posted many links to like the Cosmos page and the parcel scale. So if you've clicked on a link, you've probably found your way to the churn website at this point already. But I just wanna highlight the many, many fabulous resources that have been curated here on this website for Washington. So for example, uh, it provides an overview of coastal hazards with relevant research and tools for each of those hazards. So not just sea level rise, but erosion, other forms of flooding, et cetera. There's a resource library that helps to orient coastal practitioners and stakeholders to the most relevant resources, tools, guidebooks, et cetera, that are available for engaging in this coastal resilience planning space, especially because we know that while there are a lot of resources available at the national level, folks might not see the relevance to Washington or maybe those national resources aren't addressing the complexities of Washington. And so this is a, a curated place to find things that we know are relevant to Washington planners. Um, let's say you have a question and you're just looking to find someone else to talk to about it. Well, the, the churn maintains a member network with a searchable directory of coastal resilience practitioners around the state from different sectors and with different specialties. So that can be a great way to build your network or see who else is working in this space. It also has a case study mapper highlighting different efforts around the region. And there's also a listserv with a monthly newsletter, so you can stay up to date on job postings, upcoming workshops and trainings, funding opportunities, and the like. Um, and I see uh, Noah, who is one of the co-managers of Churn, he just posted some information. So I really encourage you to sign up for the Churn listserv and to visit the Churn website. 
And the last thing that you want to do, uh, that you can do if you want to get more involved, is to um, become familiar with a couple of events that the churn puts on. So one of them is an annual meeting. Uh, the most recent one happened in May of 2024, and it brought together a huge range of uh, practitioners from various sectors and locations around the state. Um, the event sold out like there were way more people who wanted to come than the venue was able to contain and I think it just shows the energy and the amount of knowledge that's built in uh, here in Washington uh, amongst our coastal practitioners and the churn is really intended to get those connections and those lessons learned shared and then additionally the coastal the churn uh, runs a lunch and learn series so that Whatcom County uh, lunch and learn that I mentioned that's going to be on September 17th you know another plug for that but that's being hosted by the churn so please sign up for that they also have the recordings from past um, lunch and learns posted on the website so if you want to hear Ian talk even more about the parcel scale voice vulnerability assessment. There's a recording of that. Um, and there's some other topics about frontline community resilience and tribal community resilience. So just another huge plug for the Coastal Hazards Resilience Network. And with that, uh, I think that brings us to the end of our presentation. We left 15 minutes for questions. I think that's pretty good. So um, Marielle, I'll pass it back to you. Thank you. Wonderful information and lots of great questions in the chat already. Um, please feel free to continue to drop questions in the chat, or if you'd prefer to raise your hand, we can let you unmute. Um, but to start, um, I think there's a, an interesting question just around um, drinking water intersections mm -hmm. here and where that sits in the phase of development. Yeah, so I think that question was in regards to drinking water wells factored into the parcel scale vulnerability assessment that I described, um, if I gathered it correctly. And uh, the answer is no. Um, and the reason is not because we didn't uh, identify that as an important asset within areas that may be impacted by sea level rise. It's because we, um, I think I mentioned briefly that we sort of have this like, you know, data requirement, sort of what, what can we include? And it's things that have a regionally uniform uh, data set that we could find. And we could not find one for drinking wells. We also couldn't find one, for example, for septic systems, which is an, one that we've sort of also said, hey, this is something we would love to include. And um, I think it was Paul Williams also included a note about, you know, can we sort of build in things um, like maybe more simply building value, perhaps in a more complicated way, you know, ecosystem valuations into an analysis like this? And again, the answer is probably yes, if we had access to that information. Um, in the first phase, we, for, for buildings, for example, we used um, Microsoft buildings footprints, um, which for those of you that you know, are, are familiar with these. It's a really kind of amazing data set, like the kind of thing that only like a Microsoft or a Google can pull off. Um, and we were glad to have it because um, it gave us a footprint for every building or at least most buildings um, uh, in these kind of sea level rise exposed areas. But it includes nothing at all except for the building footprint. There's no attributes. It doesn't tell you anything about whether you're looking at a shed or a a commercial building or a critical infrastructure building or a expensive house or, you know, that kind of thing. So um, in the second phase, which again, we're just launching, we do anticipate pulling in uh, a new data set, um, the National Structure Inventory, NSI, which some of you may be more familiar with than I certainly am, but that does include some value attributes for things like buildings that we do have, hope to pull into the analysis. Um, you know, habitat becomes a little bit more complicated. Uh, there are ecosystem valuation systems out there, um, but there is no sort of like, you know, uniform regional data set for Puget Sound that says, hey, this is the value of this habitat at this spot, which is kind of what we would need to pull it in. So um, hopefully addressed a couple of questions at one time. Yes, you did. I really appreciate um, your ability to tease apart those different considerations. 
We also had a question um, very specifically on the Cosmos front around the dyna dynamic water level info and whether or not that accounts for king tide variability. Yeah, and the answer is yes, it does. Um, basically, so um, Cosmos, you know, Sydney threw up a, um, a sort of a screenshot of the results. Uh, maybe also, could we get a link in the chat to Hera again, um, which would allow you to go in and look at the results for Whatcom County. So you'll notice that you have the option as a user to choose a sea level rise scenario. So, so you're choosing sort of the amount of sea level rise that you want to look at results for, and also a storm scenario, which is represented as a return frequency. So you can choose, for example, a, uh, a 20 year return frequency storm, a 50 year storm, a hundred year storm, for example. And those are those kind of like storm scenarios are derived from the historic record, um, from a mix of, of tide gauge information and wave modeling driven by historic uh, weather conditions. And so that's gonna incorporate basically any of these processes that have operated in Puget Sound for the last at least 50 years or so, including things like, uh, you know, king tide variability driven by where high tides and storm surge combine. So, so yes, um, it's represented in there. Um, I think we had another Cosmos question, although it slipped my mind. There was a question about just how it's used in the parcel level physical vulnerability assessments. Um, which, oh, yeah. And then as part of that, whether or not that can be downloaded as GIS shapefiles. Oh, so yes. So folks Thank are getting you. excited to interact with it. Yes. So, um, you know, Cosmos, um, so, so in the parcel scale vulnerability assessment that I described, we do need to have inundation layers. We need to have these layers that we can pull into a GIS that tell us where do we think the water may be in the future? And Cosmos provides that, but Cosmos is currently not available for all of Puget Sound, which is what we need for that vulnerability assessment. So we could, it's not built into phase one. Um, it's not gonna be built into phase two, because again, we just launched the second phase, whereas Cosmos results, if you recall that map that Sydney uh, showed, um, won't be available for all Puget Sound, probably at least for, I think it was a year and a half to two years. So um, so they won't be in phase two, but uh, we are very interested in incorporating those results into that kind of vulnerability assessment, right? It is kind of the best information that takes into account multiple flood drivers in a way that makes the most sense to incorporate. And so a lot of our thinking right now in the second phase is building a framework for pulling in those results when they're available. Um, the results for phase one, which again included most of Puget Sound, didn't include much of the strait, are available on the Coastal Hazards Resilience Network website um, as a geo database. So as a, you know, a GIS file, um, it's really unfortunately sort of only accessible if you are a, you know, a power GIS user. But again, our second phase is focused on um, making those more accessible by building out a website where you can interact with those results in a more, you know, straightforward way. Awesome. Thank you. Um, I'm seeing some great resources being shared and some suggestions on where Ian and Sydney you might find some of the, the data as you're exploring for subsequent phases. So we'll be sure to share that um, offline. One of the questions is is just looking at the federal role here um, and specifically the 75 million that Washington received to strengthen climate ready coasts and curiosity on how those funds might impact or improve some of this climate hazard analysis. I can start by taking a crack at that. Uh, so a Washington Sea Grant um, is a partner on that grant and I think it fits really nicely into the the four priority areas and maybe perhaps uh, more on the the second two priority areas the um, connecting advancing and training and also um, supporting community um, 
adaptation and resilience initiatives. Um, a lot of the, the funding, as, as I understand, I was not involved in the development of, of, of the specific proposal and maybe Ian knows better, but really focused on this proposal is going to, or the project is going to uh, include, you know, on the ground habitat restoration, multi-benefit projects that are in benefiting not just the ecosystems, but also the communities that live in those areas and, and to reduce their exposure and sensitivity to hazards. And so I think that really hits home the um, kind of the community focused and very place-based work that Washington Sea Grant focuses on and that increasingly our other partners like the Department of Ecology, who's the lead on that grant, um, are recognizing the importance of. Um, it's also going to um, support kind of that local fellowship work. And so bringing more capacity to local governments and tribal governments to, to do the work and to um, give them capacity to go after additional funding to manage projects and to really um, kind of implement maybe vision uh, visioning work that they've done in the past, but have not had the capacity to get that to the next step or to even support that visioning work of what their community would need to address the specific hazards that are located in those areas and then help move it through the pipeline. Because you know, the, the time from recognizing a hazard to getting the community together, to getting the grant, to actually doing the work can be years to decades long. And so Washington Sea Grant, you know, as Ian was kind of alluding to, um, when when we and when our partners work in communities and kind of embed in these community projects for the long haul, that um, that has, is where we've seen a lot of success in Washington. And I think this grant uh, recognizes the past success that Washington has had and is providing even more resources uh, for us and our partners to support communities. Ian, would you add anything? I, I guess just, uh, you know, there's a, been a few comments that have come in or questions about, you know, data sets like, hey, can we use county assessor data and that kind of thing for this kind of impact assessment sort of thing. And for us, when we're sort of looking at it from a Puget Sound scale, the answer is no, because we don't have data sets necessarily that are consistent and uniform across Puget Sound. But um, one of the things that, and, and I'm just repeating what Sydney said for emphasis, one of the things that that um, uh, Climate Ready Coast Initiative will fund, for example, is our fellowship program. And that fellowship program, which again, Sydney mentioned um, during the presentation as well, was is kind of specifically designed to try to enhance local capacity, especially for those jurisdictions that um, have highlighted that as a need. And one of the places that we can, you know, that, that we are seeing um, local jurisdictions innovate right now is in very sort of localized vulnerability assessment. I mean, we're doing this thing for all of Puget Sound and that's all fine and good, but really you get a whole lot more detail if you limit the geographic scope um, and you can pull in county assessor data or you can pull in very localized information that you have about, about a particular place to really understand, hopefully identify key vulnerabilities and then hopefully identify projects um, for addressing those. So we start to pick away at the low hanging fruit. Um, and uh, so again, that fellows program is the connection, I think, to the Climate Ready Coast Initiative. That project also is going to fund a bunch of quote unquote resilience projects um, in Washington state that have already been identified. Um, and so that's going beyond the kind of assessment into, you know, what do we actually do to uh, hopefully uh, reduce risk and improve resilience in, on Washington's coast into the future. Awesome. Thank you. Um, as we wrap up, the last question is from Paul Williams about how the prioritization will be used and therefore kind of the implications of some of the assumptions that go into um, the, the assessments. And I'm sure throughout you've had to really wrestle with that. So curious, any reflections you have there? Yeah, this is a great question, and and um, I'm I'm oh Paul asked that question, um, and um, the the um, the idea behind our sort of most fundamental use case for the parcel scale work that we're doing is is really targeted towards where investments are being made in the shoreline now. Most of that currently is happening through restoration activity. So the idea is just to sort of provide another layer 
that may help to to sort of provide insight to those restoration practitioners about like, hey, where are the important places to target or work um, in Puget Sound? A lot of that prioritization is currently focused on, for example, habitat uh, function or habitat supporting processes, which makes a lot of sense. Um, so this could just be another layer to put on top of that. Um, there are a lot of risks of using these kind of data-driven approaches, um, especially if they're using used without filtering through, you know, some of the things that we know they miss, which is a lot of things, you know, that uh, Paul highlights, you know, if we're using building values and not ecosystem services, are we biasing the analysis towards those kind of dollar and cents considerations? And the answer may very well be yes. And so there, there has to be some filtering that happens when we apply information like this. There's no way to capture everything that we care about. It's really just a starting point. The idea uh, is to jumpstart us beyond looking at a inundation map, for example, which is oftentimes our starting point for vulnerability assessments. Previously, maybe this jumpstarts us a little to um, more nuanced conversations a little bit quicker. Wonderful. Well, thank you both Ian and Sydney for these fabulous insights. Again, we'll post the recording, the slides. Um, if you enjoyed this, we hope you'll come back next month for our next roundtable on the 1st of October with Kyle Welbind. Um, we'll be looking at genomics and some of the work DFO has been doing there. Also, if you're just interested in geeking out and connecting with other peers, um, don't forget to sign up for our coffee chat to get connected with someone else in the region um, by next Tuesday so that I can do all the magic on the back end to connect folks. But with that, we will let everyone get back to their day and thank you all. Thank you. Thanks everyone.